Today I am joined by someone I'm really excited to have on uh, the podcast. Peter, would you mind maybe just saying hello and uh, giving a brief overview of what you do? Hey, hello. Uh, yeah, I'm super happy to be here today. Uh, so I am a software engineer from Poland. Uh, I live uh, in Krakow. And I've been working professionally with Ruby since like 2007. And I work for a company called Theorem. Uh, we actually recently rebranded from Citrus Byte to Theorem. We're a consultancy from the US. Um, so I work there as a solutions architect, uh, which uh, means more or less that uh, I do a lot of stuff related to technology, including programming. Uh, and right now I'm working with uh, Ruby daily. Uh, and I also work a lot on open source, um, mostly on RobMRB and DryRB projects. And yeah, I guess that would be it. Awesome. So we'll just kind of go ahead and dive right in. So you mentioned you've been using Ruby since 2007. Um, were you doing programming before that? And if so, what like led you into Ruby? Yeah, so I started working as a developer um a bit earlier so it was like roughly 2004 2005 uh and i started with php like a lot of people um and after like one year of working with php i got really like really tired of the language so i started like looking into some alternatives and i started learning python but then for some reason I, oh, I remember, I accidentally found a job offer from a local consultancy and they were looking for a Ruby developer. So I was kind of looking into Ruby already. Um, so I decided, yeah, let's, let's try and apply, which I did and they hired me and I started working for them in 2007. Um, so that's how it all started. Um, and yeah, I've, graduated um, from uh, with the uh, computer science degree. So I also did some programming during my studies. Was your first job uh, do doing Ruby, was it actually in Rails? Yeah, yeah. It was a pretty 100% Rails um, job. So I started with Rails 1 point something. I don't remember exactly. I don't know that... Even today that I know of a, t a ton of jobs that are just like Ruby without Rails. Yeah, it's it's pretty common to to just use Rails. Although in my company, we actually um, stopped using Rails except some um, older projects. Uh, but these days we, we don't use Rails. Uh, it's, it's no longer like a default go-to framework for us. So there are companies who actually stop using Rails. But yeah, it's very uncommon. That's for sure. That's interesting to hear. So what, uh, if Rails isn't the default per se, what are some of the other options that you have or that you tend to lean towards when you're starting new projects in Ruby? Uh, well, I'm like super opinionated. So um, I, I typically use uh, like things from DryRB mostly. So we started using Rada framework um, initially and now we're like, slowly moving towards Hanami. Uh, but yeah, first I want to see Hanami 2.0 released um, and then I will probably start using it right away if I have a chance, obviously. I am uh, super interested in Hanami 2.0. We had uh, Luca on the show and we also had Tim and we kind of talked about, I guess, some of the decisions around like moving towards 2.0. Uh, are you also involved with the Hanami team on that? Yeah, so we we actually decided to like start working together. Uh, by we, I mean people from DryRB and RomRB core teams. Um, like, there's there are like a lot of things that we want to achieve that are just identical. So we decided, well, it makes no sense to uh, like work um, separately. So we decided to start helping each other. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm trying to help with uh, the model part, especially because it's based on ROM, but it's it's still using uh, a very old, I mean, a very um, a relatively old version of ROM. So I'm trying to help 
um, like rebuilt Hanami model to use latest version of ROM and improve ROM itself to make it a better fit for Hanami. Um, but yeah, I'm also interested in many other things. Uh, obviously, the time is, is a problem always. Uh, so I cannot do everything that I want to. But yeah, I will try to help as much as possible. You do a lot in open source. Um, do a lot around DryRB and you started ROMRB. And I was just walk- watching uh, one of your talks today and you were talking about how you were on the data map record team and then you made Virtus. And I'm just curious how you got started doing open source and how it's kind of uh, the path it's led to today. Uh, yeah, so I started helping with data mapper project. Um, I don't even remember exactly when it was. But around 2009, 2008, 2009. Um, so I started helping with the data mapper project because um, I started looking for some active record alternatives and I found data mapper and I thought that it's cool. So I started using it. But it was you know, pretty, pretty early um, in, in the history of the project. So uh, there were some bugs, there were some missing features. So I started like helping with this. And eventually, um, I, I just joined the core team, um, I think, in 2010. Um, so then I like extracted one of the APIs from Data Mapper. It was called the Property API. And I turned it into a standalone gem, which is called Virtus. Um, and we figured that we're going to build Data Mapper 2. So that was supposed to be like the real implementation of the Data Mapper pattern. Uh, so Virtus was like one of the uh, one of the, the the pieces that we wanted to use, and then we started working on other things. Uh, and yeah, things uh, kind of exploded for me. So I started contributing to other projects, um, and like one thing led to it to another, and yeah, here I am working on like thirty plus projects. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you for working on all the projects. I don't know how you find the time to sustain that, but. I very much appreciate it. Yeah, I don't find time. It's kind of crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Talking about data mapper, so you said version two is going to be an actual like implementation implementation of data mapper. Um, First question I want to ask there is what are some of the differences between like data mapper and active record? Yeah, so there is one big difference Um, in, in active record you have um this this one to one mapping between the structure of your database and the resulting objects um that you will have in memory so when you have a user with id name and email it means that your object will have id name and email attributes right um so that's like the assumption that the pattern the active record pattern makes um with the data mapper pattern there's no coupling like that. You can have a different database structure. Um, I mean, you can have a database structure that is different from um, the uh, the object structure, um, and it's it's done through uh, like a separated uh, mapping layer. So the data is um, fetched from the database, and then it, it it must go through a mapping layer so you can convert the data to whatever structure you may need. So that's a huge difference because you can like model your um, your objects in any way you want, basically, um, and like reduce the coupling between the database uh, structure and your objects. So that's like in a nutshell. So we wanted to achieve that part, um, and yeah, I guess that's it. So what kind of got you first interested in using something like data mapper i i assume you said you joined the core team in 2010 so i assume it's sometime around there you started using it uh what led you to do that over using like active record so um first of all data mapper project as i mentioned um it was an alternative to active record but it would still be close to i mean it was an active record implementation, right? So it wasn't really a data mapper, a true data mapper. Uh, and we wanted to solve that because, I mean, change that because there was no real alternative in the Ruby ecosystem. And in my case specifically, I 
I like I had a lot of trouble uh, caused by this this tight coupling between the data database structure and the objects. Um, I had to work on a bunch of projects uh, with a lot of different data sources that I would have to use some external data source to like grab the data from somewhere and then convert it to a different representation so that I can store it in a database. And an active record library doesn't really help you with that. So active record, the library and data mapper, the library, um, they both didn't really help with this. So um, I was like completely on board uh, with just changing the pattern, the underlying pattern of the library. Um, I actually don't remember exactly how it was decided to, to just rebuild the library and use the data mapper pattern itself. Um, it was so, so long ago. Um, but yeah, my personal motivation was to just have a real alternative uh, to active record because it's basically the only pattern that we had in Ruby. Right. So did data mapper to ship or is that what became ROM RB? So uh, it basically changed its direction at some point. Um, I started experimenting with um, like a more lightweight approach to working with data in Ruby. So I built like a quick proof of concept using a SQL uh, library. And just, I think I used Virtus for the objects, like for the for defining classes and, and, and having um, like attributes with types. And I use SQL, um, it's, it's data set API to like build database queries and just get the raw data from the database and then instantiate objects using Virtus. So I built like a very, very simple proof of concept and it worked very, very well. And I figured that this is what I want ROM to become like, this is the 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 architecture that is just it works much better and it's much simpler than the data mapper pattern so i just rebuilt i mean we already had like a very early prototype of rom which was like moving slowly towards the data mapper pattern but i decided i'm not going to do it i'm not interested in actually doing this so i rebuilt rom in like one month um wow. yeah yeah cuz you know i use sql which solves a lot of problems. Um, so it was relatively easy to, to build a, like a working version of the library. So I rebuilt ROM and it became, I'm not actually sure <laughs> what it is now. <laughs> it's kind of hard to define. Uh, I'm not sure if there's like a, like a pattern that would describe it. Um, so I just call it a data mapping and persistence toolkit. <laughs> That's like my definition. That's that's a fair definition. Um, yeah, one. So I've been finally like toying with ROM, uh, and I've used Tanami model, which I know is built on, like you said, an older version of ROM. I think like one of the one of the things I've been kind of like butting my head against on a recent Active Record like Rails project uh, was I needed to do some like somewhat complex validations. And I found myself like kind of doing some like acrobatics to get it to work. And I was thinking back to like using Hanami where like per validation happens controller level. So like you have a params uh, validation. And so once I kind of like experienced a little bit of that pain, the Hanami and uh, kind of subsequently like ROM approach to no validation like inside ROM I really started to appreciate that. Yeah, I, I know that a lot of people are surprised that there's no idea of, of, of validation in ROM. Um, but I think that having it like externalized and like closer to um, like edges of your system, it's it's just much better to keep things there because like every use case that you have in your in your in your application. It's like it's, it, it, it needs its own validation. You can't, you can't have like one centralized model and say that every time it's used, that's the validation that needs to run. That's how people end up with all these like conditionals and, and like various switches using some special features of, of, of an active mm -hmm. record model to like, su like support different scenarios. But it, it gets messy very quickly. Um, and yeah, like you, all, you also have things like 
the data that your that your application receives is just different from what you're gonna what you're gonna persist. So you want to validate uh, a data structure that, that it's just different from 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 the data that you have in your database, which also needs to be modeled by something that it's external to, uh, like your ORM or whatever it is that you're using. So yeah, yeah, we're trying to solve um, this kind of problems uh, for sure in Hanami. I was reading this past weekend through the Programming Phoenix book, and they were talking about, uh, I think they were talking about maybe it was change sets, something within like using Ecto and how they kind of talked about this thing you just mentioned that sometimes like maybe the data you give to create is data different than the data you want to give to update. And like, those are two different validation sets. And I was like, yeah, that's like, that's the words I've been trying to use uh, to figure out like kind of why validations are hard when they're all together and with your like persistence and everything. Yeah, that is, that is very true. Um, but I think in Ecto, it's still like part of, of the library. I mean, the validation part, um, but it's not as coupled to like other, other parts as an active record because an active record, I mean, the library, um, it's like very, very close to, 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 to the model and the persistence related um, stuff. Uh, so yeah, Ecto, Ecto has a much better um, design here because the, the validation is, is like, it's part of the library, but it's nicely decoupled, at least from what I've seen. My experience runs about everything I just told you. <laughs> I've read, read a little bit of a book. So ROM's not the only project uh, you work on. You have many, many libraries under the DryRB umbrella. And I know there's uh, several core team members that work alongside you. How did that project come about? Uh, so I think in 2015, um, Andy Holland decided to build a couple of libraries and he was already like helping with some some things related to ROM, uh, so we knew each other already, and we were just chatting about like um, just having small libraries that would be like composable and reusable that you could like add to an existing project without any problems. So he started building this type of libraries. Uh, he built like this, what eventually became dry configurable. Um, and we thought that it would be nice to have like a single, like one place on GitHub to just like group all these projects. And we came up with, I think he came up with um, the name DryRB. And I was like, yeah, awesome. Let's do this. It's short. I love it. Um, and it wasn't taken <laughs> on GitHub. So uh, <laughs> that helped. Uh, so yeah, he created the organization. And like, I think. Like two months after it was um, it was created, I started contributing. So I built Dry Auto Inject. I think this was my first library. So I I created this project. Um, then Andy started experimenting with um, some validation library, which eventually became Dry Validation um, that I rewrote like two times, I think. Um, so yeah, and then it just kind of started growing. And more people started just helping with the libraries. Um, and then Tim Riley joined us and started working on dry transaction and other jams. Um, yeah, then Nikita built a bunch of cool stuff like dry monads. Um, so yeah, and it's been growing since then. For those who might be listening and unfamiliar with the set of problems DryRB solves, do you mind just giving a quick overview? Yeah, sure. So. So DryRB is a collection of, of libraries. And the idea is that every library should solve just one specific problem. And I'm not necessarily saying that every library should be like a micro library. Um, we're definitely uh, don't want to have like 1000 libraries there. Um, but we're trying to focus on like solving some fundamental problems. Um, so for instance, um, I created this library called dry types which helps you define type objects that can, for instance, uh, perform some coercions or apply some constraint, constraints uh, to, to uh, values. 
uh, or we have uh, dry validation for like validating input and and applying some domain specific rules. So these libraries are relatively big, uh, but they actually solve like one one fundamental problem. Um, and another idea behind this organization is that all these libraries should be standalone. Uh, you should be able to just add them to any project without any problems. Um, we we like don't use monkey patches, which is um, quite the opposite to to what you have in Rails. Um, and it's one of the reasons uh, one of the reasons why we don't monkey patches because um, we want these libraries to be you know, easily usable in any project, and we don't want to have any kind of conflicts. Um, also, monkey patches are just really crappy abstractions. Um, and also, it, it's great when you can just compose a bunch of libraries into a bigger framework, right? So, like having a very consistent API, very consistent behavior is important. Uh, and we, I think, pretty much achieved that. Uh, you can like use a lot of Dry, dry RB libraries just together. Um, and yeah, uh, we actually started thinking about like creating a couple of groups of libraries within the dry RB organization so that you can see that there are some like underlying core libraries. And then on top of them, we have like high level abstractions um, just so that it's easier to see uh, how things are organized and how you can. Uh, use certain libraries and which libraries will uh, fit your use case better. Would you say that Hanami 2.0, like working with Dry and ROM, is kind of like the fulfillment of that idea that you can just pull these libraries together and make something out of it? Yes, for sure. Um, I, I actually have like a pretty strong opinion that a good framework is a framework that consists of a bunch of smaller libraries. Um, like frameworks are great because they allow you to move very fast and they and they like provide you with the structure uh with like best practices and all this stuff this is great right but every project that becomes like a bit bigger right um you will start having issues with the default behaviors like default uh functionality and you will have to do something that is just more custom and when you have a framework which doesn't provide you like simpler uh, abstractions uh, that are like underlying abstractions, then you will have trouble. Like you will either hit some kind of limitations, you will have to, I don't know, monkey patch something or like rebuild some part of, of the framework so that you can just achieve whatever you need to achieve. But when you actually have smaller, simpler abstractions under the hood, you will still be able to leverage them, right? So that's like at least my big idea to have a framework that consists of smaller libraries. So yeah, I think that we're like slowly moving towards this goal with Hanami too. That's awesome. Shifting gears just a little bit, uh, still within the the Ruby realm. If I recall correctly, your Twitter Twitter bio says that you are literally an award winning Rubyist. Do you mind telling us a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Um... Um, there is um, something called Ruby Prize, uh, which is a prize funded by uh, the Ruby Association from Japan. Um, and every, like each year, people can um, vote on who should get this award. And then uh, winners of the, of the award are uh, invited to the Ruby World Conference in Japan. So um, I was one of the so-called final nominees. Like I didn't win the, the main prize, uh, but I won like one of the prizes. So I got invited to Japan uh, to Ruby World 2017 um, to get the prize from, uh, from Mats himself, which was pretty awesome and a pretty amazing moment in my life for sure. Oh, and you, <laughs> oh, and by the way, you like you get this award because people think that you contributed to the Ruby community in some significant way. So, this was awesome for me. Yeah, I think they got that award right. So, <laughs> uh, we kind of touched a little bit, like, on some of the things uh, about Rails. Maybe you don't like. You have a blog post from three years ago, I think it is, that was 
my time with Rails is up. And I'm just kind of curious, what are some of the things that maybe you started to experience, and we've touched on this a little bit, but that kind of led you away from like Rails being the default thing you use now into uh, the world as you kind of have it today? Um, yeah, so for me, like the, the, the main trigger um, for like writing this article was I was like so tired of of dealing with all kinds of issues in in the gems that I maintain related to Rails, and it would be mostly related to either some monkey patches that cause some conflicts, or that something doesn't work with code reloading in Rails, and I would like keep having these issues, and I I was like, okay, I'm done. Um, and another thing was that I didn't want to spend time trying to support Rails because like you need to make sure that something works with Rails and then you need to like provide all kinds of additional uh, integrations so that it's easy to use something within Rails, right? So I noticed that it's taking just a lot of my time and a lot of time of other people. So I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I want to focus on like, other things, including using different web frameworks. Um, and yeah, and I was kind of angry, so I wrote this blog post. Um, so yeah, <laughs> these days, yeah, I, 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 these days I use Rota, but I'm actually really looking forward to switching to Hanami. Yeah, I remember, I remember when that blog post came out. It was a, it was a hot topic. Yeah, that was by an accident, like, <laughs> wasn't intentional. <laughs> You and Tim Riley are two of the people I first like saw videos that really kind of changed the way I started thinking about programming. And my career is like I did a little bit of PHP and I learned Java in college to like a, a embarrassingly small amount of Java. But so like Ruby and subsequently Rails have been really the only thing I've done the past six seven years, and so when I came across like the videos y'all had given or talks you had given touched a lot on about like using functional concepts and blending them in with OOP concepts in Ruby. And that was like mind boggling to me because at the time, like Elixir was kind of fresh out the gate and a lot of people were talking about it. I kind of felt like, Oh no, like I'm missing something by staying in Ruby. And then here were two people saying like, you can take these concepts and use them in Ruby and like, you'll actually have better Ruby code. And so I, I kind of wanted to talk about how you first kind of started exploring for lack of a better term, like the functional blending of OOP in Ruby. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's definitely one of my like favorite topics. Um, so it, it started with, uh, um, with, Data Mapper, um, the Data Mapper two effort basically. Um, so um, Dan Cobb, uh, who used to be um, the uh, maintainer and one of the core members of, of Data Mapper team, started experimenting with um, using like immutable data structures in Ruby, or I should say, just using immutable objects in Ruby. Um, so he started experimenting with um, this idea that you're going to write Ruby code in a way that you don't have to rely on mutability at all. So that was like the very first step for me because I felt inspired by this. Um, so I started um, just doing the same thing, just just writing Ruby code in a way that um, there's no need for like mutating objects. Um, and then I just started digging into functional programming in general. So I started learning about functions and how you can compose them um, and all this stuff. And I started like looking at Ruby code and realizing that you can you can use many of, 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 of these um, things from functional programming in Ruby, um, which turned out to be a good idea. So Rome was actually the first big project that I wrote in, in, in this style um, where there's like no need for uh, mutating objects and you have a lot of um, really functional um, sort of constructs like 
in ROM, you have relation objects, right, that give you access to the database. Um, but they are modeled as functions, and you can compose them in the same way as you would compose functions, um, which is like the very uh, um, core idea behind how associations are implemented in ROM. It's just function composition. And it's just crazy simple. Uh, I, I still cannot believe that it, it was so simple. Um, so once I realized that this is not a crazy idea, this is something that works very well, and you can very easily uh, just blend object orientation with functional programming in Ruby, I just started just talking about it and, and, and writing about it. Um, and then with, with dry RB libraries, um, we have a lot of examples of, of li libraries in Ruby that have a lot of um, just functional features. Um, and yeah, it's, it's becoming better and better. One of the things I'm most fascinated by, like the functional approach is, uh, of course, my context is mostly, I, I have two like contexts. The first is following along people who do Elixir. And the second is Rich Hickey, uh, who actually, the ROM RB site linked to a video of Rich Hickey. And that also changed my life because I like, I have a really bad problem where like everything he says, I'm like, oh, that's right. Like everything I know is wrong. But uh, one of the things that like people kind of talk about is the simplicity, which I know is kind of hand wavy, but of using like functional languages or functional constructs because you can easily keep in your head all the things you're doing. Um, is that something you, is that an attribute you kind of find of the blending of FP and OOP? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, talking about simplicity is not simple, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is kind of ironic. Uh, but uh, my experience is that the code becomes definitely simpler uh, when it's more functional and less object oriented. By object oriented, I mean like typical object orientation with a lot of mutability and relying on mutability. When you like remove this part, the code becomes simpler, much simpler. So yeah, I think and and for, yeah, for me, um, watching uh, Rich Hickey's talks that yeah, was definitely uh, maybe a life changing moment. But um, yeah, it changed a lot in my brain, sort of. Like I remember specifically when he talked about uh, object relational mappers as something just horrible. And this actually got me thinking like, what am I doing? It was just a hunch back then. Like I wasn't entirely sure if it, if it's, if it makes sense, but yeah, it got me thinking. And I, I thought that it might, yeah, he might be right. And yeah, he, he, he was right. <laughs> so kind of along that same path what kind of keeps you using ruby over like maybe just switching to a like purely functional language or even just a different language altogether um there are many reasons um i mean first of all um i had a chance to work with um other languages during the last um like three four years so i worked a little bit with closure um i worked a little bit with scala I tried to learn Haskell like two times and failed. Um, and I would just keep coming back to Ruby. Um, I also started like playing with Elixir, like a lot of Rubyists out there probably. Um, but yeah, um, probably reason number one why I'm like still deeply interested in Ruby is because I love the community. Um, I think we have one of the best communities, programming communities in the world. Um, and I also still love Ruby, just the simple fact. I just like the language a lot. Uh, it enables me to experiment with a lot of ideas very, very easily, very, very quickly. Um, and yeah, I can build a lot of stuff with it and like verify certain uh, like architectural ideas. Uh, so that's, this just makes me happy. Um, like I'm, I'm very interested in sort of like just abstractions that are not, you know, specific to any language. Uh, and like, I don't really care if I do them in any specific language. 
And since I know Ruby very well, I can do that much, much faster. So uh, from a like, pragmatic point of view, this works very well for me. Um, so yeah, and I just enjoy working on open source and I have a lot of open source projects, so I don't want to stop working on them. Mm. Oh, and obviously my work uh, is a big part of it. I, I, I use Ruby at work, so that, that keeps me motivated a lot. Yeah, I, I share a lot of the the same things. Uh, minus the open source part, I'm terrible about doing open source work, uh, mostly because uh, I feel like an imposter, but that's another topic for another day. I I very much value the community around Ruby. And like for me, it's still very much like, I don't know if it's because I've been doing it for air quotes so long now, but like it's kind of how I view the world. Uh, it's like when I sit down to like at a computer, I just kind of think in Ruby now. And so I, I still really value it. And the, the idea of programmer happiness, like I still feel all that. So that's really cool to hear. So I guess kind of uh, wrapping up is there any, uh, anything, I mean, we've already talked about ROM JRB, any other projects or things going on that you'd like to share? Um, yeah, uh, so there is one big project, um, which is called documentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like, w over the years, we've, we've built just so much stuff, and there's there's just so much functionality in all these libraries. And I don't think that half of that is documented properly. So mm -hmm. I've started, I've started looking into like building, um, just using a better setup for, for writing and maintaining documentation for both ROM and dry. Um, so I, I found a project, I think it's called Antora. Oh, let me just quickly look, just, Try to find it. Yeah, so I found a project called Antora, uh, which uses uh, ASCII Doctor, um, and it's designed to um, for like building a static website that uses multiple sources of documentation. So you have like a bunch of repositories, and it can uh, just fetch documentation from remote repositories and just build the website uh, using multiple sources, which is exactly our use case. We have a bunch of projects and we want to have a documentation website that just covers a bunch of different projects. So I started looking into that and it's 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 pretty awesome. I've built like a proof of concept with uh, dry schema and dry validation documentation and it works very well. So I will be um, like rebuilding dryrb.org and romrb.org websites using this uh, new tool chain. And then I basically want to find as many people as possible to help us just document everything. Um, I think like this, this is probably one of the most important things to do these days uh, for both projects, just improve documentation. There's just so much stuff that you can do and people don't know it, <laughs> you know? Mm. Um, and yeah, so that's 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 an upcoming thing. And there's also one really interesting project that um, uh, Nikita from DryRB and RomRB core team started working on. It's called uh, Dry Effects. Um, this is uh, based on algebraic effects. Uh, I'm not an expert, so I cannot explain this to you. I can only say that it's a cool idea. Uh, I'm still kind of wrapping my head around it, um, but there's a lot of potential in this project. Um, I think that uh, React is moving to um, like rebuilding the whole thing using algebraic effects, which is called hooks in React. Um, and this is basically the same idea. So we're like we're trying to build the, the same thing with Ruby, um, and it's like super generic. Like you can use it for many things. So for instance. Uh, Nikita started experimenting with um, building an integration uh, with auto-inject so that you can have a dependency injection using algebraic effects, uh, which is cool. 
So this is based on fibers, by the way, uh, which is not a very popular thing in Ruby. Uh, but we are known for like doing unpopular things in Ruby, so it fits. Um, so yeah, this is also like an upcoming project um, that is worth mentioning. Yeah, those both sound really exciting. Oh, one more thing. So even though I mentioned that I did Rails, uh, but I, <laughs> I'm actually less angry these days. So I'm actually thinking about establishing a project called the Dry Rails, um, which sounds funny. Uh, but it would be like the uh, Rails integration with a bunch of conventions um, and integrations for Rails and Dry RB gems. Uh, like a project for like getting started quickly with dry RB and Rails. Uh, so my plan is to like build something very, very basic, like give a, like a starting point. And then hopefully uh, we will find some people who would like to um, just expand it and, and, and build um, whatever we need it to do. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's another, another big, big, big thing on, uh, on my plate. That sounds awesome. I I feel like uh, something like that would also help people who are maybe uh, intimidated by like making the jump to something like just diving into dry RB, like, Oh, just use it here in an environment you're familiar. And that sounds awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, one of the biggest problems. People just, just don't know how to start. Um, like the nature of the libraries is that you have just a bunch of smaller pieces and you need to like, just combine them into something. Right. And a lot of people, especially uh, people who are just less experienced, it's, it's, it's just too hard. And there's no, um, so there's just no good resource that would explain it to you like very clearly. Like if you want to use dry RB with rails, like follow these steps, there's no such thing. Um, and even if we wanted to like document it, it would still be just maybe not messy, but it would be too complex for like many, many developers um, because Rails really, as a framework, it really requires a lot of integrations. So mm -hmm. yeah, you just need to hook into Rails and you need to provide all kinds of things so that adding a gem is nice, like feels good. It's, it's a good user experience. You, you just need, you need an integration. Um, that's why I think that we need dry rails basically so that it's it's easier to get started um and yeah and have documentation for it <laughs> sure that's awesome um aside from projects any uh places people can find you on the internet or any talks or anything like that you want to mention yeah so i have a website it's uh, solnik.codes uh, and people can also follow me on Twitter. I'm uh, Solonic with like underscores. So underscore Solonic underscore. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's it, I guess. Um, I had a couple of talks this year. Uh, one is about demystifying functional programming in Ruby. Um, I uh, gave it recently uh, at St. Petersburg Ruby conference. Uh, it was recorded but it's not published yet, I think. Um, so yeah, that probably answers some of the most common questions related to functional Ruby. Uh, so yeah, um, I recommend checking it, out, checking it out. And yeah, yeah, I guess that's it. I will take the opportunity to plug, uh, I think it's your full stack fest video from a while back. Uh, and then there's, did you give a talk at RubyConf Australia? Uh, yeah, that was about, I think, they, uh, sorry, uh, Rome RB. That's right. I watched both of those. And then I recently, the one I watched today was your Ruby Day 2016 uh, about innovation. So I highly recommend all those to anyone listening. And thanks so much for joining me. I am really grateful for not only you coming on the show, but just the knowledge you share and the things you build. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. It was really nice talking to you.